Stalin and Mao, because of conventional prejudices, have the reputation of epitomizing, you know, uh, big government. Because it's just what you think, but you haven't thought critically about it on the basis of an analysis of actual historical fact and evidence. You haven't looked through the fucking evidence. You actually haven't read any real, neutral, scientific historiography on Stalin or Mao. You just have- you just read that fucking stupid infographic fucking show on YouTube, and because of the weight of this prejudice that Stalin and Mao represent big government, could it possibly fucking occur to you that every fucking turn of their political career, Stalin and Mao strive for cheap, efficient, and yes, limited government at the expense of their own party bureaucracy. If you don't understand this in the case of Stalin, I'll just be like, yeah, you're a dumbass. You don't know anything about the history of the 1930s or the various factional party struggles that occurred through the 30s up to the Great Purge. You don't know about the 1947 meeting that literally put Stalin on the hit list for all these fucking party bureaucrats. You don't know about any of that shit, fine. But to not understand how Mao wanted cheap, efficient, and limited government, Mao who literally empowered the Chinese masses as written in the Unknown Cultural Revolution by Dong Ping Hong to literally set up their own local institutions of governance, administration, and power at the expense of local party bosses who they would literally put dunce caps on and shame. Mao is the guy whose little red books were distributed forms of sovereign authority. Any idiot peasant could wield a red book and literally be the equal of any party boss in their local fucking town. Nobody in China was experiencing tyranny from Mao, except the people who were in power, all the way in Beijing. If you're a local peasant, the average fucking person in China, the only tyranny you're experiencing is at the level of your local bosses, your local bureaucrats, the local people in power. And Mao, with his cultural revolution, empowered peasants to literally I mean, it's literally like a Ron Paul audit the government, challenge the government. That's what the fucking Cultural Revolution was. These peasants would go and just talk shit to the actual symbols of the government. And they could say anything they wanted. And they had power over them. That's a stereotype of the Cultural Revolution. You don't even need to do any in-depth analysis of what the Cultural Revolution is. If you're vaguely familiar, this is what you get from a cursory very vague level of familiarity. Now, in the case of Stalin, you may be so stupid that you go around using the name Stalin without understanding the crucial context like the 1936 Stalin Constitution, which was the most democratic constitution in the history of humanity, possibly up until this point, which yes, did establish limited government. If we define government that is limited by some kind of formal procedures and protocols, Stalin was fundamentally anti-bureaucratic in his orientation. And yes, at every opportunity and chance he got, he wanted to severely limit the scope of government and establish established a cheap, efficient, simple government. In 1944, for the first time during the war, there was a joint convocation of both the Central Committee and a session of the Supreme Soviet. Molotov and Malenkov prepared a draft for the Central Committee, according to which the party would be legally distanced from power. And this is consistent with what Beria's son said what Stalin wanted to do, because Stalin thought the party lords, the party bureaucrats, were a bunch of lazy do-nothings. He literally wanted to strip power from the party and give it to the institution of Soviet democracy. The party would be legally distant from power. It would retain only agitation and propaganda. It simply forbade the party from interfering in economics and working of the organs of the state. Stalin read the draft, changed six words, and wrote agreed on it. What happened next was a mystery, because Khrushchev and all these fucking people dropped it. They erased it from history. This is in continuity with what Stalin was trying to do in his 1936 constitution. Sheila Fitzpatrick tells the story of young Komsomols engaged in activism. Now, what does activism mean? It meant challenging authorities and challenging the corruption of the authorities. The struggle against the corruption and obscurantism of local officials. They invoked the name of Stalin only in order to challenge the actual local tyrants and forces of corruption, bureaucracy, and big government at the local level. So look what Stalin says. Some comrades think that the thing to do is to simply nationalize collective farm property 
to proclaim it public property. The collective form was a civil economic institution, not a state one. It wasn't exactly private property in, under a classical capitalism, but it was not state property. These were collective farms owned by the people working on them. You may think the idea of a collective farm is uh, scary, whatever. This is perfectly in continuity with Russian civilization. The commune, the mir, was a fact of Russian peasant life for hundreds of years. They've always owned the land in common in Russia. Individual land ownership was a foreign artificial in uh, innovation created by Stolypin. Stolypin created the artificial institution of individual land ownership. That's what gave rise to the Kulaks. We Americans like individual ownership, but it's not part of Russian culture. The collective farm was a new, in Stalin's view, socialist form of civil, civil property. The collective farms had contractual obligations to the state in the form of quotas, but all excesses to the quotas could be sold on the market. And they could do whatever they wanted with them pretty much. Further, the collective farm is a cooperative enterprises. It utilizes the labor of its members and distributes its income among its members on the basis of workday units. This property of the collective farm is its product, the product of collective farming. Grain, meat, butters, vegetables, cotton, sugar, beet, flax, all things that get to be freely sold in a free market on the collective farm markets, the Coco's markets. So you're saying, well, the collective farm doesn't own all these other things, the state does. All that means is they can't sell the land. They can't buy and sell the land, which is the good thing because Speculation on land, which the buying and selling of land eventually leads to, leads to monopolies, debt, banking monopolies, things libertarians don't like. But as far as the fundamentals of a libertarian economy, where people own their own products of their labor and get to do whatever they want with them on the market and shit, Stalin gives them way more freedom. You have more freedom when the land is public. You have more freedom when the instruments of, of production are public, depending on which instruments. I mean, you, that, there's a range of what that means. In China, it's just the land. The instruments are not public property, for example. All I mean by libertarian is a general tendency toward wanting to limit the scope and scale of government and the powers of government. Doesn't mean he wanted a weak state. He wanted a very strong state, and he made that much as explicit. Strong doesn't mean bloated. Strong doesn't mean bureaucracy. Strong means simple, clean, and to the task. Stalin, relative to his contemporaries, was a libertarian. He wanted to strengthen the civil institutions of the people at the expense of the centralizing state institutions. Stalin, at every turn, wanted to give power to the people. And it was his own party bureaucracy that tried to stop him. And after he died, Khrushchev reversed all this, abolished the Kolkos markets, and that's where the totalizing state machine, the completely inefficient bureaucratic broken Soviet state machine has its origins in. Khrushchev's reign of glasses-wearing technocrats completely destroyed the fucking Soviet Union. It destroyed the popular basis of the state. It's the collective farm that was the basis of Stalinism. Khrushchev fundamentally erodes the power of the collective farms. He devastates Soviet agriculture and Khrushchev increases the power of the urban, institutionalized, state institutionalized Soviet society. That's not what Stalin wanted to do. Stalin wanted to deepen his institutional reform to be more inclusive to the masses and also more decentralized for the masses. He didn't want one center to dominate everything. Now Stalin failed. Stalin failed because he didn't purge enough. That's why after Stalin's death, Khrushchev comes. Look what Khrushchev did to the collective farm as an institution. He devastated Soviet agriculture. They believe the conversion of property of individuals or groups of individuals into state property is the only, or at any rate, best form of nationalization. What does Stalin say? This is not true. The fact is that conversion into state property is not the only or even the best form of nationalization, but the initial form of nationalization. Unquestionably, so long as the state exists, conversion into state property is the most natural initial form of nationalization. But the state will not exist forever. With the extension of the sphere of operation of socialism and majority of countries of the world, the state will die away. And of course, the conversion of the property of individuals or groups of individuals into state property will lose meaning. 
We still have no developed systems of product exchange, but the rudiments of such a system exist in the shape of the merchandising of agricultural products. But it mentioned in passing that merchandising is not a happy word and should be replaced by products exchange. The task is to extend these rudiments of product exchange to all branches of agriculture and develop them into a broad system, under which the collective farms would receive for their products not only money, but also manufacturers they need. Holy fuck! This like is kind of like the Hamiltonian system that the LaRouche people always want to talk about. You know what's so insane about Stalin's proposal? He's saying we want to incentivize surpluses of production in return of peasants selling their surpluses to the state. Not only are they going to get money, which, I mean, can the state really compete with the market price? Probably not. So how does Stalin propose to overcome the market economy? Use the state to exchange the products that come from the collective farms for manufacturers and instruments of production. In other words, technology that overall increases the forces of production. The state invests in the technology and it's up to the people to make the profit. And they have an incentive and it's not based in force. It's based in an exchange. He literally calls it products exchange. Stalin is a fucking libertarian for all intents and purposes and if you don't think he's a libertarian he's at least libertarian in comparison with the caricature painted of stalin as a guy who wants to create this totalizing state that just fucking owns everything no he doesn't stalin wants to deepen the avenues of exchange he wants to respect forms of property that are outside of the state and deepen those forms of property. 